So Colossians 4, chapter 2 to 4. Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful, and pray for us too, that God may open a door for our message, so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ, for which I am in chains. Pray that I may, may proclaim it clearly, as I should. Hebrews 10, 23 to 25. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. At our church over the last uh, four weeks, we've been doing a teaching series called Plan A, uh, looking into God's Word about the topic of faith sharing. Um, what does it mean for Christians to share faith? How can they? Why do we want the world to know uh, what we know about the good news of Jesus? And how can we go about it? This is a course that's been devised by a lady named Belinda Lakeland, who's uh, an evangelism uh, pastor at Gaimea Baptist Church and uh, who works around the place helping Christians to understand these things. And we've been uh, working through each of these principles one a week, uh, beginning with growing, the idea that if Christians are going to share with other people, they themselves need to be growing in their faith. That's where we begin. Uh, growing disciples are going to want to share the good news that has changed their life. And knowing others, we, we need relationships that are meaningful and real in order to share the good news. It comes from a place of love and knowledge. Uh, but we want to sow the word of God into people's lives. The Bible talks about sowing and um, we thought about how it is important for us to eventually want to share the good news with other people. And so in our own personal lives and friendships and conversations and acts of kindness, we do those things that are intriguing to people that might lead them to ask why we are Christians and we seek to explain to people our own faith. We sow small seeds into the lives of people that might one day lead to faith. And fourthly, last week we thought about rowing, uh, the fact that we share faith as a church together. We are a team. We rely on one another. And the most effective way of the gospel going out into the world is when church communities are united and cooperating and are pulling in the same direction. We are a team. And last but not least is the fifth principle, which we'll think about tonight, showing up. And the idea with this principle is how important it is just to keep going. Uh, faith sharing can be hard. Being a Christian can be hard. And a vital contribution that we make is just by persevering and continuing day after day, year after year for our whole lives. We show up in prayer. We show up in love. We show up in witness. We show up to church and commit ourselves to God's people. And if we are doing each of these things in our daily lives, we are going to make a contribution to the sharing of a faith in this world. So uh, I'm going to think about showing up uh, right now. And tonight uh, we'll do the sermon in two parts. So in a moment we'll, we'll have the first part of the message. Then we'll take a break. We'll uh, sing a song, try to get that message into our hearts. And then we'll um, think about some applications in the second part of the message. Let me pray before we start. Our Father, we thank you for a message that's worth sharing. But we acknowledge that it uh, can be hard to do so. And uh, many of us have had lots of opportunities to tell other people that we're Christians and get a lot of different reactions. Some of us have never had the opportunity. Um, and the world will certainly, uh, many people, say that uh, Christian faith uh, is without any foundation and has nothing to commend it. But uh, we want to go against that expectation. We pray that as we thought about this over the last few weeks, we'd have been given help to do that. And that we might get some more help tonight and be encouraged in this last principle, showing up, and that we might be challenged here. And we pray that, that you might get glory. Amen. Well, last week we talked about the church as a, a rowing team. I wonder if you've seen those rowers at the Olympics I'm thinking especially of the, the sort of eight-man, eight-woman 
rowing teams, those large uh, speedy boats that they race. And in those boats are these massive, physically flawless human beings, men and women, about as fit as a person could be. And if you watch them, as I have done, at the end of the race, they are all exhausted. Um, There are some exhausted people here tonight because they've been at youth camp and uh, I know some will be tempted to fall asleep about now uh, during the message. I can see you, okay, so just don't, don't do that. No, it's all right, you've got permission, you've had a big, big weekend. But the rowers in these boats are, you know, sucking in the oxygen like their life depended on it, sort of collapsing and they fall back on each other. They kind of, they kind of lie back in the boat looking like they are about to die and that they are in agony rowing just like belonging to the church no i'm joking but it is difficult it is difficult to be a christian people give up all the time Uh, they just they run out of energy jesus did not say the mission would be easy It's true, Jesus does the work that we cannot do. Jesus, the gospel says, lives a totally righteous life before God that nobody else has ever lived, dies for sins to conquer death. His mission is to save us. Our mission is not to save ourselves. So he does that work, we don't. And we'll see in a moment that, in a way, He is, of course, the key to to us doing our part as well. But we do have a part to play. He gives the people that he saves a mission on this planet. And he did not say it would be easy. What did he say? He said to do it right, it would have to come first in your life. That part of you that seeks your own glory would have to die. Luke chapter 9, verse 23, Jesus said, If anyone wants to follow me, they must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Now, does that sound easy to you? And he said to the first disciples, When you go out and do what I'm telling you to do, they're going to kick you out of their synagogues, They're going to drag you before the kings and the trial and the courts of the land and they're going to put you in prison. They will kill you. But you will have the Holy Spirit with you. The Plan A principles remind us that the command Jesus gave is not easy, not even for Christians today. There can be discouragement and weariness. Maybe you're a young Christian, all fired up, ready to go, ready to row, to get out there and share faith. Talk to an old Christian. Man, you can get tired. The older you get, the more familiar you are with your own failings and they wear you down. Experience of Christians letting you down in the church. Friends who are just not interested in your faith at all. They don't want to hear it. Maybe no one ever even asking me about my faith. And sometimes looking to a life outside the church or outside of Christian faith that seems a lot greener, a lot brighter, a lot easier. So at some point, if we're feeling that, we might just stop praying. Stop praying for people. We stop inviting people. Stop volunteering. Stop giving Stop speaking, stop reading God's word, stop learning. We just stop turning up to church. We stop showing up. But listen to me, you disciples. You must not do that. You've got to keep going. There is too much at stake. Jesus didn't promise it would be easy. But he did promise something. He promised himself for the mission. 
He promised he would be with the disciples every step of the way and all the way to the end and he promises the same to you and I. He promises that to you personally, to be with you. Think about that. He promised this because the disciples would need him. Why? Because the job is hard. The disciples were sent to the people who killed Jesus and they had to tell those people that Jesus was the risen king. We need him because our task today is difficult because of the sinful heart of people. It's very hard toward God and only God can change it. We need him because our successful world protects people from suffering so successfully a lot of the time. People never even, the thought doesn't occur to them that they might need God. Walking around the planet like they are God. Invincible. And because in Australian society, a lot of people think, you know, we've already tried Christian, Christian faith. We tried that already. No thanks. Thanks. So it's difficult. The amazing thing is, however, that (laughs) the plan worked. There were just these 12 fools, doofuses really, from Palestine 2,000 years ago with not much to commend them at all. And yet now the planet has heard the name of Jesus. Why? Because the plan did not depend on the disciples' greatness. Belinda Lakeland says it doesn't depend on the disciples, it depends on them depending on Jesus. The plan does not depend on the disciples, it depends on them depending on Jesus. If they just keep showing up and depending on the power and the presence of Jesus, the plan cannot be stopped. So be devoted to it. Paul said in the verses that Holly read for us, Colossians 4, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And pray for us too, that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Paul says, keep showing up in prayer. Be devoted. And he says, pray that I keep showing up and doing my bit. Paul was in chains, in prison, but he says, I need to keep going. I cannot give up. Pray for me to do the same. Be devoted in prayer. Be devoted to one another. Remember Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23. This was written to Christians, by the way, who the writer in that letter said, uh, only suffered a little bit. The writer said, you've not yet suffered, you Christians, to the point of giving blood. So they must have had it easy. Just imagine it. What a jolt these verses are. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. For he who promised is faithful. There it is, depending on he who promised. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching keep showing up for one another the writer says some give up meeting together you must not keep showing up to church it's going to put strength into your spine so that you can walk tall and proud to own the name of Jesus in this world Verse 25 says, The day of Jesus' return is approaching. The dreadful, awesome, joyful day when the verdict is given. And those who followed the king and those who said no, well, it will be finally revealed. So help each other depend on his promise. Verse 23. To depend on him. He is the hope we profess. And keep going and going and going by showing up and showing up, not giving up, 
in showing up. So with that hope, the Christian moves forward in life and longs to share what it is that they have found in the person of Jesus. Sermon part two. Well, we're almost at the end of this short uh, five-week series, Plan A. So I want to take a moment uh, tonight to recap the five principles. And Belinda Lakeland, the inventor of the course, gives a handy way of remembering these five principles and involves using your hand. Handy. Get it? Anyway, it doesn't matter. Five principles, five fingers on your hand. And uh, you might find this helpful. And if you go, if you've got the Plan A booklet, um, you can look up one of Belinda's uh, videos where she's explaining this. And I'll go through and I'll recap what the principles are. Uh, the first one, growing. And Belinda suggests you might use your thumb to uh, think about this particular principle. The thumb is sort of the strong finger on the hand, the wonderful, amazing, opposable thumb that allows us to do so much. And uh, you might also think about the green thumb for the gardeners as well. Growing. And we begin here, as we say, with growing. That is our strength and our capacity to share faith um, and to live as a disciple that's got to come first. We, we want to be followers of Jesus ourselves and grow in our relationship with God, invest in that relationship, learn about him, put our trust in him. So trust in Christ, be convinced, be a convinced Christian, live a holy life that commends God, that grows in faith. Uh, first one, growing. Second finger, over to the other side of the hand, the pinky finger, the littlest finger. Belinda suggests you might use this to remember the next principle of knowing. Knowing others in real friendships. And she says that this is because it's the many small things that make up a relationship of trust over a period of time. The small things we say, the small things we do, being there for other people. This is how a person demonstrates they're a real friend. Small acts of kindness small conversations but over time these things build trust so we're growing as a christian we're putting in an effort to actually know people to demonstrate god's love to people in a real friendship lots of small things add up third principle sowing actually sowing something of christian faith into people's lives and belinda says how about you think about using the pointer finger for this one sowing why because we don't just live a certain way as christians we do want to point people to jesus at some point that is our longing and that is our genuine desire to actually speak words that might point somebody toward the hope that is in him most of us are not evangelists we're not masterful defenders of christianity we're just ordinary christians but we can all be sowing seeds in conversation, you know, faltering, halting, short conversations, real life, just to and fro conversations in which we communicate to people that, yeah, I'm a Christian or I was at church on Sunday, uh, in which we ask people, what, what are your beliefs? What do you think? What, what makes life worth living for you? Where do you get your meaning from? These sort of conversations can point people to investigate Christian faith. So sowing, the point of finger. Those scattered seeds may be small, but when people find out we are Christians and they hear our answers to questions, curiosity can grow and faith can begin to emerge. We're explaining why Jesus is so compelling to us personally. The tall finger represents the uh, middle uh, finger that is the tallest. And Belinda says, why don't you use... The tall finger, the largest finger, to represent rowing, the fourth principle. The idea is that together we're bigger. You know, we are bigger and better together. When we row as a church, we can do things that we cannot do on our own. And each Christian has gifts and capacities that are unique to them and that God wants to use to see people come to faith. And so you need to use your Christian brothers and sisters as you seek to share faith and to use the Christian community 
We thought last week about how the Christian community itself is compelling. Um, It is convincing. It helps to convince people that Christianity, there might be more to it than they thought. Because they didn't really know any Christians before. But now knowing some and seeing the community in which they live, it's just that little more possible, plausible. So we become more than we are on our own when we row together. We become taller and and capable of more things. Christian community is convincing. And lastly, today's principle showing up, uh, the ring finger is the last one. Today's principle why the, the ring finger? Showing up and depending on Jesus. The ring finger represents commitment. So those of us who are married, or some of us who are engaged, have a, a ring on that finger to symbolize commitment to a, a marriage, um, a lifelong commitment. And sharing our faith is a lifelong commitment to God, to our church, to the world. It is not always easy, like a marriage is not always easy. But we keep turning up. We turn up in friendship. We turn up in prayer. We turn up to church. We get up in the morning to live as a Christian for weeks, for years, for a lifetime. Growing, knowing, sowing, rowing, showing up. Remember these truths. Tell it to the hand, as it were. And the hand will speak back to you. Think about it. Take these principles out into daily life. And when we live these out, ordinary Christians like us get used by God to do extraordinary things in people's lives. So that's a recap of plan A. I hope it's been helpful to you. I want to finish, however, with some challenges that come from the last principle from showing up. Showing up and depending on Jesus is a general principle for daily life as a Christian. That's just what you're doing. But it's also a pretty sharp challenge for our life together as a church. I want to think about that. And by that I mean the challenge to just be at church on Sundays. Showing up as a Christian in general has got to at least mean showing up to church to be with your Christian family. We talked last week, as I said, about the power of Christian community as well as the power of our meetings to be helpful to people who are investigating faith. The meeting matters. Sundays are significant, not just for your own growth as a Christian, but for promoting the gospel to the many people who visit our church, who are not yet Christians, but but they're interested to hear. And there are always some to several people at our church interested in investigating faith and experiencing the Christian community. And our Sunday meetings help that to happen. You being here helps that to happen. The best way for us to put our best foot forward is for all of us to be here. Now I tell you, a cracking, joyful Bustling Sunday service is a contribution, I assure you of that. And the number of bodies in the room makes a difference. It changes the atmosphere, it lifts the spirit, it builds confidence. And if every week we have a lot of our people away from the family gathering, it decreases the ability of the Sunday service to do its work It's vital work of witnessing. Because it means crucial people with crucial gifts like you are missing the chance to bless others and be blessed. It's a fact. Let's admit it. The great COVID, I don't know what to call it, malaise, cloud, laziness is real. Something has happened to people's commitment to things in life, in society, in general. A mysterious kind of laziness or even a fear of doing things or going out as often. 
is in the life of a lot of people. We find it easier to not show up to things and to be in that habit since the pandemic. Apparently, even now, restaurant dinner cancellations are way higher than they used to be before the pandemic. I was reading an article about restaurants in London and uh, they said they were used to, in the old days before COVID, you know, about a 5% cancellation rate. You know, 100 people book into the restaurant that night, five people cancel. You can handle that financially as a business model. But even now, without COVID restrictions or whatever, those cancellation rates in restaurants in London were apparently 25%, 30%. People make a booking and they just don't turn up. It's not because they have to isolate. They make a booking for Friday night, they get and they think, I can't be bothered. I'll stay home and watch Netflix like I did for four months when we were locked inside. Something has happened to people's willingness to commit to things. It's real. I just can't be bothered. And this has impacted many churches profoundly, impacted them severely. It must be time to say no more of that. The great COVID monster of apathy, it needs to be shot in the head. Kill it. Slay it like a dragon. Think that is dead and buried. Killed by the hand of gospel passion and the zeal that comes from the Holy Spirit. Next February at our church, February 2023, a few months' time, the Add One Challenge is coming to MOBC. It's very simple. Okay? It is not complicated. The senior pastor is just challenging everybody to come to church more. That's all it is. Okay? Come to church more. Come to your growth group, your midweek Bible study more regularly. In February next year, I want everybody to conduct an experiment. I want you to add one to your usual attendance at church. Just for one month, just give it a go. See if it doesn't make a difference to your spiritual life. So if you're in the habit of coming once a month to church, come twice that month. Just add one. Don't come every week. Just add one. Okay? And don't exaggerate how many times you come to church. Okay? I know how often you come to church because I'm here every Sunday and the software tells me how often you come to church. So if you're not sure how often you come to church, all you've got to do is ask me. I can pull it up on my phone and I can tell you right there and then. So if you're in the habit of coming to church around about once a month, say, you know what, I'll go twice. If you're in the habit of coming about twice a month, say, you know what, I'll add one. I'll come three times that month. If you're in the habit of coming every week to church, then pick a Sunday, come twice, right? Five times that month. Won't hurt, won't kill you. Add one, see what happens. See if it doesn't somehow enrich your spiritual life, put strength into it. If something good doesn't come from it. Make a difference to your confidence in God, your joy in the gospel, your spiritual health. I feel very deeply that Christians have got to draw a line under the last three years and be back together with deep, loyal commitment to one another. Next year offers many other opportunities for you to live out these principles that we've been thinking about. MOBC gives plenty of stuff to take advantage of when it comes to faith sharing. The Alpha course at our church helps people come to Christian faith every year. And could Alpha... The Alpha course at our church next year in 2023, could it be the biggest, the best, the most electrifying, spirit-filled ever in the life of this church? Could. You could be a part of making that happen. You know the reason why we keep showing up as Christians day to day in our walk it's because of God we are driven by who God is 
And he is the God who keeps showing up. Have you ever thought about God that way? He keeps showing up for you, you know. It's amazing. The nation of Israel in the Old Testament, they thought God was long gone. And then he turns up in a burning bush to save the people. He is there on Mount Sinai. The people feel defeated. They feel afraid. The people are poorly led. Has the Lord let us down? Is God even present with us anymore? And then a shepherd boy named David steps out from the battle line with a sling and a prayer. God has come to his people again. God always comes to his people. In the lion's den of Daniel, he is there. He shows up. He never gives up. And then of all things... In a manger in Bethlehem, he is there. He keeps coming until he eventually comes in flesh, in human life. Oh no, they say, the Lord is dead because we killed him on a cross, rejected by his own people, but no. Then to a room of quaking, fearful disciples, Jesus returns, appears, resurrected. He shows up. Peter let Jesus down, but Jesus just comes back to him. Oh no, they say, has he left us as the disciples are left looking up to an empty sky? But no. Jesus then sends the Holy Spirit with fire and power to be with them. He keeps showing up. How many times have I not deserved anything? And yet God is here to rescue, to console, to be present, to discipline me, to forgive me, to love and command me. He is unrelenting in his love. He keeps showing up for these creatures, these sinful, luminous, miraculous, wicked, mysterious, strange Creatures that God cannot let go of. You. And if he never gives up on us, how could we give up? If you trust this is true, I think you will have a a holy dissatisfaction. That is a, a healthy dissatisfaction and frustration if you are a Christian. You'll be fed up with the assumption that churches are going to decline. You'll be sick of the negative narrative about Christian faith. You'll be angry at the idea that a rising secular tide is going to drown out all belief in Jesus. It will disturb your spirit that people think that. And you will want to prove that it's not the case because it is not the case. Jesus said the kingdom will advance and the gates of hell will not even be able to stand Against And you'll be angry about this and driven by a zeal to see the name of Jesus honoured in this planet. And you will know with certainty that a dynamic, living, suburb-changing, radically loving, missionary-sending, gospel-teaching, Jesus-obsessed, rapidly growing, better-than-it's-ever-been church can be right here in this place that you can be that, that we can be that. We must be that. The need is too great for us to be anything less than that. The world needs its king. So you depend on him. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we know that the world needs you more than anything else, just as we need you more than anything else. Remind us again tonight of your goodness, what it is to know you, 
to know that the God of the universe has reached down, in fact, has kept showing up in our own lives with mercy time and time again. And because of who you are and what you're like, we want to keep showing up. We want to go on. We want to persevere. We want to express with appropriate commitment a desire to love your people, to help row in that boat in order that seeds might be sown to people who are truly known that they too might grow to know you have their lives and their eternity changed. Please make it happen, we pray. Take away our fear. Help us to be joyful, confident disciples. Because it's the living God of mercy that we serve. And it's the one who is like no other, Jesus, who is our King. Amen.